it's not every day that you get to hear the end of a story of such and everything works out. Often, what we have is in those arenas, folks are martyred for their faith. Surely made mention in terms of we here in America, we do live somewhat of a sheltered life in terms of our, our desire to serve the Lord and uh, as I think of our desire to serve the Lord, that often we think that Jesus has paid all of the costs. But there's a cost that we too that's required of us. I'm sure they made mention to it in terms of dying to ourselves. That if you want to find your life, you're to lose it. Those are Jesus' words himself. So as we come to engage in our second stanza of hope, I wanted to share some things with you. I wanted to share with you the fascinating facts of the number 10. The number 10 holds a fascinating array of facts that highlights its unique and significance across various domains, from mathematics to sports, from history to popular culture. The number 10 has left its mark in numerous ways, whether it is the basis of a number system or its prominence in the metric system. Number 10, historically significant, in many cultures, the number 10 holds the historical cultural significance. For instance, ancient Greek believed that the number 10 represented perfection and completeness as reflected in their decimal, in their decimal numeral system. Here in the United States, we have the Bill of Rights contains 10 amendments that makes reference to you know, protecting our rights. But the 10 I want to highlight today has to do with Christianity, has to do with the Lord has put in place. The number 10. 10 is viewed as being complete and perfect. 10 is made up of the number four, which represents the physical creation. God did what he did in terms of creation. The number six, which symbolizes the day in which man was made. Those two come together. It's 10. As such, the meaning of 10 is one of a testimony, a law, a responsibility, completeness in the order. We find in Genesis 1 the phrase God said 10 times. He gave to us 10 commandments. He told us that we should pay a tithe, and the tithe is tent. The Passover lamb was chosen on the 10th day of the first month. Jesus' coat of colors had 10 colors. It was the 10th generation of man that lived on earth before the flood came with Noah. Noah represented the 10th generation. There were 10 plagues 
in Egypt, there were 10 versions as Jesus spoke about this return. There were 10 lepers that Jesus healed in him. And then there were 10 I am's in the book of John. So we see the significance of 10 to the Lord. So in the bulletin, I gave you an attachment. And that attachment highlights that there are seven, as we say, New Year's resolutions. And as I said, our New Year's resolutions needed to be focused on the kingdom agenda. And it starts out with asking the Lord to enable you to lead 10 souls to the kingdom. And all of those tens, and there are more tens in the Bible we could have pulled out. But the ten that you have in your hand, the ten that I anticipate will be etched in your heart, etched in your remembering, etched in your prayers, will be the name of 10 people who didn't know Christ, who now, now know Christ. And those 10 names would be as significant to the Lord as the 10 commandments and the 10 lepers and the 10 virgins and the 10 I am. See, because the Lord wants all to be saved. But what the Lord wants most out of us is that our hearts will be changed to be more like Christ. Christ sacrificed all to come to earth that we would be saved. And he declared that he would be the first of many. He was the first and we're the many. And he would have us to be mindful of lost people around us. But more so, the Lord would have us to understand just when he said that as you seek me, you shall find me. As you knock, the door shall be open. As you ask, it shall be given unto you. Well, what is it he wants us to ask about? Well, he wants us to ask about, about how do we live to please him? How can I get over the inertia of carnality in my life and to move where I'm perpetually thinking about the kingdom and what I can do in the kingdom that will glorify God and bless people? When I presented this to you last week, I didn't just as a you know, as an impromptu, come up with those seven items. I prayed and asked the Lord to guide me. But think if each of you undertake believing and asking the Lord to help you to lead people to Him. You know, for some of us, that's a radical change. And it's a change because at times we fear doing the very thing that the Lord has promised he will help us to do. I'm convinced. You say, Lord, give me an opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to someone. Wherever it is I am. And watch him do it. This initiative should be in every church in the world. Because look here, that's the clarion call. <laughs> that's the call. God wants to save people. 
But he wants those who are saved to see the perils the people who are not are in. Those who don't know him will go to hell. Have we become so disenchanted with our relationship with the Lord that we don't care anymore? That we don't care about lost people? If you don't care about lost people, you're missing it. If your pastor is not calling you out, he should be calling you out to remind you of your role. Not to get up in your face and to point your finger, no. But to lovingly say, hey, you are a privileged child. You are privileged because you are saved and you will die and go to heaven. You are privileged. But your privilege comes with a responsibility. This is why he gave us the, the parables. This is what the parables have been about. And we've been preaching about the parables. So I have to ask you something. Do you trust me as your pastor? Do you trust me that I'm a true man of God? You do? I have to ask this another way. Do you think I got the hook up with God? I, I, just, I just got to talk the language everybody understands. Well, if you do, are you required to follow some of the instructions I give you? You should. Okay. Let me ask you something. Since I said this to you last week, have you thought about it at all? Good. Good. Because the day I make it official. This is the official agenda of our church. Matter of fact, I've gone for it. I say, Lord, not only do I want to lead them to Christ, and I say, Lord, I want to do more than 10. Of course, of course I do, Lord but I want to baptize them too. And then I want to make sure that they are in, a, in an arena that they're getting disciplined as a disciple. They're being taught. All right. Good. So you have it in your handout. I would say that this needs to be post in the mirror where you check out and see how pretty you are before you leave to go outside and present yourself to the people. Right, right. You know, when you look in the mirror and make sure all your hair is right and your eyes are right and all that, it, it, yeah, it's, it, it should be there. Right. You, you know, maybe it should be in your car. And when you press the button or to turn the key, you see it. This needs to be wherever it is you are on a daily basis that you remember to say, Lord, help me. Give me an opportunity to lead people to you. Here's what I've learned. My passion, coupled with God's help, could bring about a change in this world. Because my passion really is a part of my hope. This is why I chose to focus hope. So for the rest of January, it's going to all be about hope. Let's look at some of what, and last week we spoke about the source of hope, and we know that the source of hope, now before we leave these seven up here, see them and, and, and have them. You know, 
I did talk about memorizing scripture. That's a good thing. Okay? Becoming a praying person. How much time you spend in prayer? Why do we pray? What's the result of prayers? What are we looking for in terms of praying? Understanding what praying encompass. It's talking to the Lord. Not giving the Lord your wish lists, but thanking him for being who he is. Okay? Making a difference in the life of someone. Yeah. You know, I I think about decisions that I've made and how it has set the course of my life. The Lord awaits us to make him the main thing in my life. That's what he wants. He, not only does he want to, but he deserved to be the main thing in my life. You've heard me say this, and I can't say it enough, that when the things of God, when the things that are important to God are important to me, <laughs> then the things that are important to me are important to God. Amen. All right? My man and I, Rob, Rob, um, huh? Ross, Ross was coming back and forth to service, and I said, I got, to, I, I, I got to get him away from here where he and I can meet, that he can come to know me, and I can come to know him. And we did. And we decided to break some bread together. And while we were breaking bread, this young man showed up, Justin. He heard us talking. We didn't say, come on over, and, and he said, I'm coming over to where you guys are because you guys are talking about God. And he invited himself over. And he's never left. And now he accompanies me when we finish here today, he accompanies me over at Sumter. And now the folks at Sumter are telling me they want to hear him. I ain't jealous. Not the least bit. I told him, I said, okay, boy, you got to start working on these messages here. He's, I told him to start working on the messages because you know what? That's exactly what I, that's what I want. That's what God wants. That's how the kingdom grows, guys. In a minute, we're going to take communion, but remember what Jesus says. Do what you do when you come to do it do it in remembrance of me. Remember what? What he did for us. He stepped out of eternity into time just for you and I. And the Lord thought so much of us that when Jesus finished his, he sent his spirit. The Lord sent himself to come and live inside of you. And if God is living inside of you, this thing spreads. The gospel of Jesus Christ. When Ross and I sat, we had no idea who this kid was. But I look at what God has done. But what God is doing is God has heard our prayer. Make a difference in someone's life. Ross made a difference in mine. 
we made a difference in his, in his, and now he's making a difference in all of those folks over there. Because what they see, they see that child that they're missing. The 102-year-old, the 101-year-old, and the 99-year-old. Wow, did I, they go on and on. They love him. Well, God knew this from the beginning. God had this plan. Number seven, develop a heart of worship. Folks, know that though we love to sing, worship is so much more than singing. When you hear the word worship, worship is to be followed with holistic. The holistic process of serving God. With your time, with your talent, and your treasure. That's us. That's our lives. You heard me make reference to the fact that time is currency in the kingdom. The same way you spend your money to get the things you want in the kingdom, spending time with God perpetuate that intimacy that God wants with us. <laughs> Listen more. Boy, that's a good one, isn't it? <laughs> now, is, is anybody here guilty of not listening? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Is anybody here of conditionally listening? Oh, yeah. Is anybody here run when you hear the wrong thing? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is anybody here treat the pastor like 5 old? Yeah, like I'm the, the, the police. Yeah, but I'm telling you, Mike, some hear me come in and they close the door and tell them we're not here. Don't answer the phone. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Don't go that way. The pastor's house over there, he may be in the yard working. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. <laughs> yeah, told Travis he need to get ready because boy, this is look at this. This is all not milk and honey, but it's worth it. But more than anything else, number seven, to be an encourager. To be an encourager, man. To say the things that help people believe that they can, and assist them when. You can. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right. So last week we talked about the source of hope. Today, I want to talk about the strength of hope. The strength of hope. You know that hope makes me more valuable? That hope's makes you more valuable? Yeah, think about that for a moment. Hope makes you more valuable. Mm -hmm. Look, if I'm walking around and I'm doing things and I'm interacting with people through relationships and so forth, you can tell that person who has hope Versus the one who's pretty well much given up. That says, say la vie, say la vie. Whatever it is, it is. <laughs> but in the kingdom, wow, why would I take such a position when I have the creator of the universe living inside of me? When I have living inside of me, he who says, that I can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens me. He who says to me, my God shall supply all of my needs according to the riches and glory and Jesus Christ. Why should I be so <laughs> when I got all this living inside of me? You know, one of the true components in coming through those doors on Sunday is to come and to see it ritual, ritualistically, and when you sit down, <laughs> when you sit down, 
it begins a countdown. Now, y'all acting like y'all don't know what I'm talking about, but y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. When you sit down, it begins the countdown. Oh, yeah. 12 o'clock when it comes, we're done. And I've done what I'm supposed to do on Sunday. So I'm going to get on out here and go live the rest of my life. There's an imminent danger in that attitude. Because that attitude says, regardless of how the Lord moved in the pastor, it ain't going to mean much to me. Because I'm just here to serve my time. I'm just going to warm the chairs here, brother. And I'm going to tell you something. There are many, many in our churches, particularly here in America, that that's exactly what the ritual entails. They show up. They go through 30, 40 minutes. And they go home. They can't wait to get in their car. So you ask yourself, who would ordain something like that? Who would be okay with that? Who would be okay with that kind of attitude? Would the Lord be okay with it? Absolutely not. Would the Spirit of God be grieved? Surely. Well, who would have that attitude and it'd be okay? Two. Two sources. One, the devil out of hell. And two, my flesh, who don't want anything to do with God. And if I have to, it's going to be on my table. Can I get an amen? So as we come in here this morning and we hear about the living hope, we hear that God is the source and we speak about the strength of hope and how hope actually enhances my value. Because now the Lord can, he can use me. Regardless of the circumstances for which I'm going through, I have the understanding that if God be for me, who could be against me? The strength of hope is an essential aspect of our faith journey. See, because we are on a journey, and on this journey, we have a focused destination. But how many times have you lost focus of the destination because of the difficulty of the journey? Can I get an amen? This is costing me too much. I am tired of having to deal with circumstances and situations, deal with people. People that are ungrateful, da 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 da. And I will ask you this one question Were you born saved? You were not. Someone had to be used to get you into the kingdom. It is the fuel that keeps us going, the anchor that holds us steady amidst life's storms. And the light that illuminates our path in the darkest of nights. You ever, you ever have any circumstances and situations where you just want to quit sometime? Of course. Yeah. But the Lord knew that. So he gave it to Paul to speak about it. Paul tells us about once perseverance has been perpetuated with us, within us, then comes hope, and hope does not disappoint. Hope is alive. It's living inside of us. Hebrews 11 and 1 tells us this. Now faith is the confidence and what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see.
I can't see it. But I know it's there. I concluded that faith and hope, they're both tangible. They're tangible. Now, someone said, hold on a minute. Ho, 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 pastor. If something's tangible, you can touch it. You can feel it. You can see it. You can smell it. You can taste it. Well, now, see, what I know about, the reason why I say hope, hope is, is, is tangible, because hope is alive. I function predicated on my hope. I come to preach to you on Sunday mornings because of the hope that I have inside of me that you're going to hear it and that God is going to touch you in your heart and that you are going to be engaged in it and then you yourself will make the decision that you're going to serve the Lord. That's what hope does. Hope had me praying this morning for my three children because the enemy has gotten after all three of them. All three of them, he's gotten after them. And the Lord has reminded me, do what you got to do, Ken. Do what you have seen me do on your behalf. Go to war. Go to war. How is that? Praying and fasting and declaring to the Lord, you got no right here. Praying that my children will be remember what they have learned and who they are and whose they are. While I'm praying for them, they're praying, they're praying also. That's the hope that we have. That trials and tribulations are an opportunity for growth. Well, let me say that again, because that should have big old man. Trials and tribulations is an opportunity for growth. When I go through them, I understand it's going to cause me to pray. It's going to cause me to turn to the Lord. This is why Paul said what he said. When Paul said that, at least I be exalted, it was given to me a spirit, an evil spirit to buffet me. Well, who gave, who gave Paul an evil spirit? The Lord God himself. The Lord, the Lord did. Isn't that something? The Lord gave this man, this great man, this man that had all to do that he was going to do for the kingdom, the Lord had an evil spirit to buffet this man. Wherever this man went, that spirit was with him. And he said to the Lord, Lord, take it away. Three times the Lord said, uh-uh. Ain't going to take it away. And you know why, Paul? Because my grace is sufficient. My power, my power is exhibited in weakness. And Paul says, I glory. I glory in my weaknesses now. I glory in my trials now. I glory in those things that normally or coming at me to cause me to quit. <laughs> Instead, it caused me to get refortified. Because when I'm weak, the Lord is strong. See, there are people out there who don't know that. That's why the 10 is so important. There are people who don't know these things that we know. And how can they know if we don't go? This is why Jesus said to them, the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. Pray for the harvest. And you know what happened when I began to pray for the harvest? I change. It doesn't change the harvest. It changes me. Because once I begin to pray for the harvest, my heart gets bonded with the harvest. And now I'm working on the things to do the things God say I'm to do. I am privileged. But I'm privileged with responsibility. I can't treat this like a country club. 
That's what the song when they were singing this morning. It's not a country club. No. Uh -uh. Scripture says somewhere up there that faith comes by hearing. Hearing the word of God. And how can they hear if there's no preaching? But I say, how can they hear if there are no witnesses? Not everybody is called to be a pastor. Not everybody is called to be a teacher. <laughs> but every believer is called to be a witness. So I, I need you to understand what this represents. The strength of our hope is not something we muster up ourselves. Mm -mm. It is not the product of our willpower or our determination. Rather, it is a divine gift. It's a gift that you have inside of you. It's a gift. You've got the Holy Ghost living inside of you. You've got the word of God. It's a gift. As grace bestows upon us by our loving Father, the same grace that he told Paul, we have that same grace. The same grace we told Paul. Paul, my grace, look here. My grace is sufficient. What I've done, I've done for a reason. I told you, I thought that the word the Lord had given me, and in the beginning, man, look here. <laughs> Pastor Charles carried me up to Nashville, and I met all of the hierarchy in Nashville, all of the Southern Baptist hierarchy, and now he carried me through all of those offices. And boy, they sit back and they said, oh yeah. And they began to open doors for me preaching all over the country. You hear them telling you? Oh yeah, I was on schedule, you went to Lifeway. Lifeway wanted me to start writing and all. But you know, God was giving me a taste. And then all of that went away. Yeah, look. It was almost like what he did with David. When he brought David in the midst of, over in the midst of Saul and David went and killed Goliath. And one would think that David would step right into the kingdom. But after David killed Goliath, he sent David back out to the sheepfold. So David could learn what it means to be king. You hear them telling you? I was raw. When he had given me a word, I would open my mouth and he would speak. I went to places like Eagle Irie, I, I'm telling you, all over the southeast, speaking. And when that was enough, when the Lord says enough, come on now, let me teach you about what it means to be a true, a true servant leader. Oh, I thought I'd be preaching to thousands. Oh, yeah. I thought I'd be traveling the world preaching to thousands. But here's what I've learned. God knows best. And it behooves you and characters like me to do it where the Lord ordains it to be done. If, again, if you want to see potential fall on their face, let potential decide they can do it on their own. There's a lot of potential has not been realized in the kingdom because they wanted to do it their way. 
And I'm going to tell you something. Sometimes humility can be a pill this big. You hear them telling you? This big. And then you got to start swallowing it up. And how do you, look here, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, baby. And you know what? By the time I got it all done, you know what I said? <laughs> Your will be done. Wherever you want it, I want it. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? So, here's what I'm saying to you. You come in a little storefront church like this, and you hear a word. And it's not the word coming from the man. It's the word coming from God. That's, dig it, that's what should be touching you. Not what I, not, uh, 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 you should be from God. But now, if you do, don't reject it. If you believe it's from God, don't reject it. I dare not get in this pit. I dare not come up here to preach to you on my own. If I come up here with the wrong attitude, <laughs> let me tell you something. Christmas Eve when my pants fell off, I get up, sit back and go, Lord, what did I do? What did I do? Did I do something wrong? Because I know the Lord, well, look here. The Lord will chastise his. Are you hearing me? But I'm saying all of this to you as I'm saying to you is that you can't, guys, look. This is real. This is real. Here you're doing the things that's important to God. Apostle Paul says this. Grace bestowed on us by our loving Father. It is rooted in his promise his faithfulness, and his unfailing love for us. Paul says this, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured forth into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Yeah. It has been given to us, the love of God. 2024, are going to test Christians like never before. Because the world is setting the stage for it. And here's what the world would love to do. The world wants to pull you, the church, in it. Because what you do as the church, you make what they're doing look okay. If things are said that you know are against the word of God, have nothing to do with it. Have nothing to do with it. Because the struggle God's people have is allowing the influence of the world to be influencing us. When this is to be the other way around. Mm -hmm. I got the truth living in me. And the truth is being edified in me by the Spirit of God that I will know it's the truth. That I will know it's the truth. You know, the devil would come in here 
and just run gunshot if we allow it. But it shouldn't be just me, the pastor, that's dealing with the devil. It should be each of you all. Each of you should recognize him. Why? Because you have the Spirit of God living inside of you. I told you the story about how those that they have working in the mint, when they bring them in for training, they never show them counterfeit. They never see counterfeit money. They spend the whole time in their training showing them the real thing. So that when the counterfeit show up, they're able to say it's counterfeit based on what they have in their head in regards to the real thing. That's the same as the truth of God's word. This is why I show you God's word all the time. Because I need you to see it and to grasp it so that when things come and it's contrary to it, you say, oh, no. Oh, oh, oh no. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. That is not God's word. And if it isn't God's word, I want nothing to do with it. So, today, as we come together and we do what he has instructed us to do, to do this in remembrance of him, this that we call communion, be mindful of who you are and whose you are. In this little storefront church, this little building who's been here since 1851, and God is still doing work in it. He's still bringing his people in. Let me tell you something. We are privileged people. We are privileged people. I can imagine when they take the long list of pastors that have come through this church and, 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 and they're running that wheel where all of the faces of the pastors are moving over, and then they get to me and go, oh, wait a minute, what, what, what happened there? <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. This must be a mistake. And then the angel of the Lord will say, uh-uh. No, no, no. It is no mistake. It is what God desired. But you know why? The reason why God brought him there, because God is in the glory business. God is in the business of manufacturing his glory through his people. So they sit back and say, only God, only God can do that. You're absolutely right. And I want you to understand, I love the Lord. And I ask the Holy Spirit to help me to love the Lord, thy God, with all of my heart, my mind, my soul, my strength. Because I've learned my greatest enemy is my inner me. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Let me say it again. My greatest enemy is my inner me. God wants to sanctify it and purify it. So bow your heads now. Let's get ready to do this. And I'm going to ask that Brother John come up with Brother Larry come up today to do the communion. Come on up, guys. Larry and John, come on up. It's been a while since you guys stepped on up here. You guys all do it up anyway. Oh, yeah. Are you going to go with him too, Junior? Oh, look, he jumps up. He wants to be with him. Yeah, our little Junior Deacon going to be there too. All righty. Bow for me a moment, guys, as we pray. No, you guys go on and get things ready. Father, as we come at this hour in the morning, we look to you. We're reminded of the legacy for what you've given to us. This church, this body, Lord, have Sunday after Sunday month after month, year after year, meet to praise your glorious and wonderful name. Because you are the ancient of days, the God who was, the 
the God who is, and the God to come. We ask now that as we stop to acknowledge you, Jesus, we're reminded that the bread and the blood represent what you gave for us, your body and your blood. But we're reminded, greater Lord, that it is your spirit, your glorious and gentle, peaceable, yet all-powerful Holy Spirit who unites us. He brings in the very essence of our communion with you, for our touching with Jesus. So today, in the matchless name of Jesus, we ask that you be glorified in all that we do. Touch our hearts. Wash us with the washing of the word of God. Cleanse us. Give to us a clean, Lord, a clean heart and the right spirit that we praise your glorious and wonderful name. We love you, Father God, because you first loved us. So today, Today, Father God, as we engage, help us to be reminded of all that you've done for us. In Jesus' matchless name we pray and all say it together, amen. amen. Okay, guys. Miss Linda and I went over to the senior center in Wildwood to do communion with one of our members, Laura. And Laura, <laughs> Laura looked at me and said, you know, pastor, you need to be visiting me more. After all, I'm one of your sheep. And I said, well, Yep, you're right, Laura. You're absolutely right. She was right in the aspect that the Lord wants us to be a body. And if the foot gets in trouble, it impacts the arms. It impacts the legs. It impacts the function of the body. Sometimes we think some things are irrelevant, but they're not when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to the body of Christ. What I desire as a body that we You know, we're really mindful that I don't have to give to you a specific title for you to do the things that are important that we do as believers. So be mindful of that. When she said to me, I'm one of your sheep, it's just like she's here this morning. And what she's saying to me, you may not see me as much as you see the others, but I'm still one of your sheep. Do we understand that, folks? All right. And I think that's most applicable as we get to engage in communion. The scripture tells us that they were together. And Jesus took the bread, and you pass the bread around the table, and he says, Eat, this is my body that was given for you. And at the conclusion of the meal, Jesus knew what he was about to undergo, lifted up the cup of wine and said, drink 
This is symbolic of my blood. It's going to be shed for the remission of the sins. And they drank. Inasmuch as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Pray for one another. Pray for that for which the Lord would have us to do. Now, I want to invite you to the fellowship hall. Um, Ms. Linda had me to taste the potato salad, and I want to tell you, if y'all not quick, I'm going to be there before you all. Because it was good. And then we got the barnyard pimp, the chicken. Yeah, yeah. Look here. You've never heard him called the barnyard pimp, have you? The barnyard pimp, baby. The chicken. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And we are yes, sir. We're gonna tear him up in a minute. Amen. Amen. So, guys, pray for one another. Spend time with the Lord. Allow him to guide you. And let us continue to grow. Amen? Amen? Bow as we close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for our time together today. We thank you that we've been able to engage in that for which Jesus left for us to do, symbolically touching with him and with one another. We understand that Jesus is sitting at your right hand, interceding for us, our great high priest. And because he's sitting there, we are too. So help us now to take on the mantle, Father God, of sharing the gospel in the kingdom that we be pleasing to him and to you. We love you, Father God. In Jesus' glorious and wonderful name we pray. And all say it together. Amen. Amen. God bless you, saints. Let's go eat. <laughs>